Our first lesson on DC circuits was focused on Ohm's law, that the current is equal to the voltage over the resistance for individual parts of a circuit as well for a DC circuit as a whole. And that is an extremely important, arguably the most important relationship we're going to learn. We're going to quickly see that to analyze circuits that are a bit more complicated, we're going to need to throw more tools into our tool bag. And the first set of these are going to be what are known as Kirchhoff's laws. Now, before we start looking into these, let's actually first make sure we fully understand how we can draw circuit diagrams from something that's more realistic to the stylized, simplified version that we can then analyze pretty quickly. So what I have right here is a, a regular circuit, and what I have is a battery with the positive and the negative end that's connected by a wire to some bulb that's lit up. The other wire on the other end of the bulb actually goes into, this is what a resistor looks like, it's kind of a little ceramic piece and on the other end of that resistor goes into a switch a wire goes from the switch it splits into two different wires one going into a resistor and one going into a capacitor this capacitor is probably a little piece of plastic with the metal plates inside and then these two wires link back up and then rejoin the negative side of the battery well the first thing we got to make sure we do is we need to make sure that we are utilizing appropriate circuit symbols so let's go ahead and look at all these different pieces and how we would represent them First off, we have batteries, and batteries are drawn with a long line and a short line, or if we've got multiple pieces, multiple cells in particular, you can have a multi-cell battery like this. But one key thing we want to remember is that the positive side is the long line, and the negative line is the short line. So this would be the long line and then the short line on this side. We have a switch, basically looks like an open door. We have a resistor, which makes a zigzag pattern. We have bulbs. There's a couple of different ways we can draw these. I typically draw a circle with a little curly Q inside to represent the filament, but I've also seen circles with X's inside. They mean ultimately the same thing. We have a capacitor, and a capacitor has two lines, much like a battery, but these lines are of equal length. And then lastly, we have an ammeter and a voltmeter, where an ammeter is just a circle with an A inside of it, and a voltmeter is just a circle with a V inside of it. So let's go ahead and end this over here in this picture, let's go ahead and substitute all these different things. We have the battery, the bulb, the resistor, the switch, and then the resistor and capacitor here at the bottom. Now, going from this point, well, how do exactly do we draw all of the wires? Well, there's a few techniques that are pretty good to utilize. One, we're going to make them look very square, pretty much a lot of parallel lines, a lot of perpendicular right angles. This helps us keep it organized. We're going to avoid any curves in the wires. We want to make sure that all the connections are closed, so basically we don't have any breaks, so we don't have an open circuit. And lastly, we want to make sure that none of the wires are crossing unless we are trying to imply that they are actually connected there. So what I have now is the battery. It goes here with the wire to the bulb. This goes from another wire into the resistor, which connects to the switch, the other side of the switch. Now at this point, we have a split. So we show these two wires touching each other, and that's implying that they're connected there. One going through a resistor and back, one going through the capacitor, and then they rejoin the negative side of the battery. Now a couple of phrases we need to make sure we utilize of this is one, when we have elements that are in series, in quotes, we mean they are part of the same loop with the battery. So, for instance, this bulb and this resistor are in series because there is only one line that the wire goes through to get all the way to this point. However, the resistor and the capacitor at the bottom are what we say are in parallel, meaning that they are in different loops with the battery. One loop goes from here through all these elements through the switch and then goes up through the resistor and rejoins and the other one goes down through the capacitor and rejoins. And ultimately thinking that if we have something in parallel and you're not 100% sure, things that are in parallel must have some sort of junction, a junction being that point where the wires are crossing, implying that they are in fact connected at this point in the circuit. So let's say we have a circuit that is fairly simple, looking like this. I've got a battery that's connected to a resistor 1, which is then connected to two resistors that are in parallel, 2 and 3, which then reconnect and then go through uh, resistor 4. Then let's go ahead and focus on the currents in the situation. Well, remember, we define current as going in the direction from the positive terminal to the negative terminal of the battery. So we're going to start off with a current going right here, and this would be the current going through this resistor. So I'm going to go ahead and label it I1. It is the current leaving the battery, and it's the current going through this particular resistor. And because it's going through that resistor, we go ahead and know that it's going to be the same current going on this side. But what happens when we reach this junction? How exactly is the current going to behave between resistors 2 and 3? 
Let's remember that this current is really a charge or a measure of charge flowing with respect to time. And charge is a physical thing. We've got either electrons or something flowing through this, carrying this charge. And charge must be conserved. We know that from the law of conservation of charge. So whatever charge we have, it can't disappear as it's moving through this circuit. It must continually make it from one end to the other. And so when we reach this split, Keep in mind something that we learned way back in fluid mechanics with the principle of continuity. If we imagine this battery like a pump, it's pumping water through the pipes of the wires, and then when we get to the split here, well, that's just like the pipe splits and then reforms. And we remember through the principle of continuity that whatever volume flow rate there is on this side before the split must be the volume flow rate out of the split. And then therefore, this part in the middle, well, those two volume flow rates in those individual pipes must combine to equal the volume flow rates of the two different points, or else water would be spontaneously disappearing. And we have the same thing here because of the law of conservation of charge. Now, looking through these two branches, we're going to have a new current I2 going this way, a new current I3 going this way from the split in the junction, and I2 plus I3 must equal the current I1. Ultimately, that that current has split at the junction, and then additionally we know that when it reaches the other junction, it's going to reform into I4, which must equal I1, which is going to equal the sum of I2 plus I3. In fact, one of Kirchhoff's rules is known as the junction rule, also known as Kirchhoff's current law, which is that the sum of the currents entering a junction must equal the sum of the currents leaving a junction. But now let's look at the same circuit once again, but consider the voltages in the circuit rather than the currents. Well, what exactly are all these pieces doing? Well, first off, when we have our battery, which I'm going to go ahead and just mark with voltage of battery, well, the battery gives charges energy, basically gives them a certain amount of electric potential energy. And as the charges move through the circuit, all of these resistors cause the charges to dissipate energy, to lose it as heat or thermal energy in the resistors. Now, if we look at this, something important we have to keep in mind is that a charge that is leaving the positive end of the battery is going to have some electric potential energy, U sub E. And additionally, when it gets to the end, the electric potential energy when it's coming back into the battery, well, it has to be zero. And why exactly is that the case? Well, keep in mind that this voltage of the battery is equal to delta UE over Q, where Q is going to be this charge. And so therefore, this charge is going to experience a change in electric potential energy as it travels through the battery, keeping in mind this is a simplified model. But when it does that, it better have zero energy when it's coming back into the battery. If not, well, what would happen? Well, basically, a charge would leave. And let's say it had a little bit of extra energy here. Well, it's going to go through the battery again and gain this delta UE but it's going to have that additional energy that it didn't lose. And it goes through it again, and it's going to gain even a little more extra energy. And ultimately, what we would have there is a situation in which energy is spontaneously coming from nowhere. So we know from the law of conservation of energy that that cannot be the case. Instead, when charges go from the positive to the negative end of the battery, whatever energy they gain from the battery must be lost to all of the elements in the battery by the time it returns. So let's say, first off, a charge takes this route, which we'll go ahead and call loop A. And so therefore, the charge leaves the battery, it goes through resistor 1, takes this side of the split at the junction, and goes through resistor 2, and then goes through resistor 4. So what that tells us is that the change in electric potential energy per unit charge, or the change in electric potential, the voltage, of the battery must equal the summation of the magnitudes of these different voltages of resistor 1, resistor 2, and resistor 3. In other words, the charge gains a certain amount of energy from the battery, it loses some energy at resistor 1, it loses some energy at resistor 2, and it loses some energy at resistor 4, so that it returns to having zero energy when it gets back to the battery. Similarly, a charge could also take this route. It could take the route going through resistor 1, then taking the right-hand path through the split through resistor 3, then reforming through resistor 4, and going back to the battery. Either way, the amount of energy lost to the resistors must equal the amount of energy gained by this battery. And this ultimately brings us to this idea known as the loop rule, also sometimes called Kirchhoff's voltage rule, which is that the net change in voltage 
and a closed loop is zero. So a charge is going to gain some plus delta V here from the battery, then lose minus delta V1, minus delta V2, and minus delta V4, so that when it gets back to here, the total voltage change it's experience is zero. Same thing would happen in the rightward path. And this automatically implies something here, because if we look at these two equations, whatever the voltage drop the charges have as they go through resistor 2 must match the voltage drop they get if they take instead this path and go through resistor 3. So in other words, the voltage across resistor 2 equals the voltage across resistor 3, meaning that if we've got two resistors or elements or branches in parallel with each other, well then the voltages of these parallel branches must match. Now there's one point I often see students getting hung up on, which is, okay, this is all well and good, but how do charges know how much energy to lose? Like, for instance, you know, how do they know if I go this route, I'm going to lose this much, go this route, lose this much? Like, what happens if instead I took one of these resistors out, and, like, let's say I removed this resistor here, well, charges could then go this way, and, well, they're not going to lose this energy here. Whenever you remove a resistor, like so, you are ultimately changing the entire circuit. And when you change the entire circuit, you are changing the electric field that is almost spontaneously generated when it is hooked up to the battery. So every time I remove a resistor, I basically have to start from scratch and go, okay, I've got a new situation, I've generated a new electric field. These electric potentials are all going to be different now. And that's going to be the case if I add something in, remove something, you must always treat it like a new situation because the electric field will have adapted and therefore all these potentials and all these currents are going to have adapted too. So let's look at a practice problem. I'm going to highly recommend you draw this in your notes and go ahead and write out all the delta v's and all the r's and i's and p's and all the question marks or if they've got values the values. Because this is going to be a pretty standard version of the types of circuit problems we're going to start looking at. I have a battery which is connected in series to a resistor which is then connected in series to a parallel combination of resistors that then go back to the battery. Now if I look here I've only got a little bit of information. I know this resistor is 2 ohms, this battery or this resistor loses 20 volts of energy. I know that this resistor is 5 ohms, this current here going through this resistor is 4 amps. That's actually all the information I have. And we're going to quickly see that with Ohm's law, with Kirchhoff's rules, and with the power equation, we can actually figure out all of the values we're missing. Treat these uh, circuit problems a lot like you would think of, of a Sudoku problem. Yeah, I know some things I don't know other things, but we probably have just enough information to plug in some values which will cue us into other values, which will cue us into other values, until eventually we have the whole thing filled out. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look and say, all right, where can I automatically apply Ohm's law, which is that I is equal to delta V over R. And I can do that in this yellow resistor and in this purple resistor. Now I know that, okay, if I got 20 volts to buy by 2 ohms, well then the current going through this resistor is 10 amps. Similarly, I look at this purple one and I say, all right, I've got 4 amps of current, I've got 5 ohms of resistance, so I'm going to multiply those together and see, okay, we've lost 20 volts across this resistor. All right, so that's the first step we're going to do. And now, okay, if we used Ohm's Law as far as I can for the moment, I'm going to go ahead and use Kirchhoff's junction rule. And that is basically telling me, all right, well, I've got current leaving the battery, and it goes through here, and here it is 10 amps of current. It comes to this junction, and we have 4 amps going through the top branch, and therefore, to keep the currents the same before and after this junction, I must have 6 amps going through the bottom branch. They're going to rejoin with 10 amps that so will then go back through here. So I know that this bottom resistor has a current of 6 amps. All right, well now let's utilize Kirchhoff's voltage rule, which is that, remember this closed loop must have a net change in voltage of zero. So let's go ahead and look through uh, the top loop. So if I have a loop going here, it gains, we don't know for instance, but it lost 20 volts right here and it's going to lose 20 volts through this resistor, and therefore, when it gets back to the battery, it must make up for that. So it lost 20 volts and 20 volts. The battery must be giving these charges 40 volts of electric potential difference. And then additionally, if I lose 20 and I lose 20 here, well then I must also lose 20 here in order to have the exact same voltage going through both of those branches. So that means the battery is 40 volts and this voltage is going to be 20 volts. 
Okay, now at this point we're going to look and go, okay, I don't know the powers, and I don't know the resistance of the pink uh, resistor. But I could just use Ohm's Law again for that one. I'm going to say, okay, now that I know the current and the voltage, I'm going to multiply those together again and go at, or actually I'm going to divide 20 volts by 6 amps and get that the resistance in this resistor is about 3.3 ohms. And now I'm going to use the power equation, where P equals I delta V, and just multiply the current times the voltage in each of these elements. So the current here is 10 times 20, so that would be 200 watts of power, so 200 joules per second being lost as heat. This one is 4 amps times 20 volts, or 80 watts. And this one is 6 amps times 20 volts, or 120 watts. And we've now seen that we've pieced all of these together, really from just these three fairly simple rules. Now, one last thing I want to look at here is, let's remember, just as a quick note, how, if we want to actually measure the currents and the voltages here, well, how would we do that? Well, to measure the currents, we're going to have to use an ammeter, and that's what those measure. And let's say I want to measure the current uh, going through this resistor. Well, I'm going to have to put the ammeter in series with this resistor so that however much current is going through that ammeter is also the amount of current going through the resistor. But let's say I wanted to know the amount of current going through this resistor. Well, I can't use an ammeter here because that current going through that ammeter is going to split. Instead, i got to put an ammeter down through this individual branch to make sure that I get only the current going through this one resistor. So whenever we're going to connect ammeters, we must do it in series with whatever we're trying to measure. If I want to know, therefore, the current in this resistor and wanted to measure it, for instance, I'd have to move the ammeter over here, or I could just calculate it based on what I know so far about the junction rule and what we've measured. But what about voltmeters? Well, a voltmeter, let's say I want to know the potential difference or the voltage across this resistor. Well, how would we go about doing that? We actually need to connect it in parallel. And why exactly is that the case? Well, I have one loop going here through this resistor, and the net change in voltage across this loop and through the battery must be zero. I would have the same thing if I went through this one. But now I've actually, by adding this voltmeter in parallel, I've actually created a new loop that goes through here, actually goes through the voltmeter, and then back through here. And if I therefore know how much voltage I have across this voltmeter, well then I'm going to know how much voltage there is across this resistor, because things that are in parallel, directly in parallel, must have that same voltage. So that concludes our lesson on Kirchhoff's rules, and let's go ahead and talk about the main takeaways. Well, one, can we draw circuits appropriately in, like, the nice, clean way and with the appropriate symbols? Can we utilize both the junction rule and the loop rule to determine the current, voltage, resistance, and power at different points in a circuit? So we want to be able to do that throughout. And can we conceptually explain what laws of physics justify the junction rule and the loop rule? That the junction rule is ultimately just a result of the law of conservation of charge. Basically, whatever charge must go into the junction must also leave the junction. And the loop rule is just basically a reapplication of the law of conservation of energy. That charges that gain energy from the battery must lose all that energy before they get back, or else we run the risk of creating energy from nowhere, which we know is impossible.